Welcome back to the Wizard Shop, and I have a really strange Volvo in the shop today, and I've actually called in a fan favorite to talk about it. Let's get started. So this is a 1980 Volvo 262 Bertone. And I'm familiar with the engine and things of that nature, but outside of that, I know nothing about the rest of it. But there is someone who does know, and you guys probably already figured it out. Adrian Hicks, or the Bug Ninja, also the Grandmaster Flash of VWs. <laughs> What's going on, YouTube? <laughs> what have you done? Well, actually, this customer brought their vehicle to the local Volvo dealership, and they said, hell no. No. They said, get that out of here. Okay. Yeah, there's uh, probably very few people left at, uh, at the store where I was that, uh, that would still work on uh, mm -hmm. these older cars. You know, not to mention that there's probably not a whole lot of parts. Yeah, that's know, I don't thing. I kind of don't blame them. It's yeah. hard to find parts. Nobody knows much about CIS injection anymore. And that's your favorite fuel injection, right? Not really. Oh. <laughs> so we'll talk about under the hood in a minute, some of the history of the engine. But what exactly is this? It's a strange looking Volvo. And what is the Bertone package? What's all going on there? Uh, Bertone is a um, well, first of all, it's an Italian design house, kind of like Pininfarina. Um, uh, where auto manufacturers send, you know, their cars, their platforms mm -hmm. to be reworked, um, kind of like what what the U.S. used to do with different coach builders way back in the day. Right. right? Uh, so, you know, in Italy, and I'm sure in uh, Great Britain and so in a few other places, there's still coach builders mm -hmm. that will take an established platform and kind of rework it. Uh, with using their design language. Okay. This one's no different. There was about 6,000, 6,600 of these built mm -hmm. uh, for, I want to say, the three, four years um, uh, that this car uh, was manufactured. Um, and it's about 65% original Volvo 240. And then the other percentage uh, points are um, Bertone. So what is the 262 model? Is that like something they added to the 240, or how did that work? The first number in Volvo's designation is always going to tell you what series of vehicle it is. So you either have your 2 Series or your 7 Series or your 9 Series, mm -hmm. and then later the 850s and things of that nature. Um, the second number is going to tell you uh, the number of cylinders it has. So this is a six-cylinder car, mm -hmm. and the last one, is going to tell you the number of doors. So okay. Volvo's are either going to be in in this body style, a 242, which is a two door, 244, which is a four door, or 245, which is a wagon. Okay. So this just the the number designation tells you everything about the car, right? Two series, six cylinders, two doors. Makes sense. Mm -hmm. It's very very odd. Let's go ahead and take a look around this car, and as we get back to the back, you've got some information on the shape of the car and yeah. how that came about. Absolutely. Huh? All right. So there's the beautiful front end of this 262, and you can see it has a license plate actually says 262C. But I'm curious, Adrian. There's several little badges on the grill here. There's Volvo Club of America, Volvo the mm -hmm. insignia. But what is the Lambda Sun? Lambda Sun was a pioneering uh, piece of technology now that every auto manufacturer on the planet has. An oxygen sensor. Volvo was the pioneering manufacturer for oxygen sensors. Um, in fact, Volvo is one of the few, if not the only, uh, auto manufacturer that has a written commitment to environmental issues. Oh, wow. Okay, so, and think about this. This was way back in the 70s. Auto mm -hmm. manufacturers were not thinking about their impact on the environment, right? Like Volvo was, so they invented the uh, the oxygen sensor to uh, curb uh, uh, emissions. You know what they do, and unfortunately, especially if you're a Volkswagen owner like I am, that also means that at some point uh, that also ushered in the era of check engine lights. Yes, right. <laughs> so Definitely. that's what Lambda Sun is. It's just uh, a Swedish way of saying oxygen sensor. Awesome. Well. That kind of makes sense. I know Lambda, that sounded familiar, that a lot of manufacturers use that Lambda sensor, mm -hmm. oxygen sensor. So, mm -hmm. all right, let's carry on around the side then. All right, let's do it. So you can definitely see some 240 lines as you go down the side here, but what I'm really seeing different is where you get to the roof and the pillars and things. Mm -hmm. So this car, what was, what was kind of different about this vehicle is probably from about this line down, this is a traditional Volvo 240. 
about 65% of the Bertoni is just a regular Volvo 240, mm -hmm. right? However, when they uh, sent the car off to, to get the coach working done, the roof pan, uh, a new, more rakish uh, A-pillar uh, was, uh, was designed in, and the wide C-pillar, these are the uh, defining uh, aesthetic features of the uh, 262. So here's the story. Volvo at that time had kind of revolutionized how um, uh, the assembly line worked for more efficiency, right? Um, instead of just, you know, you're at your station working on your thing and then the car moves down the line, right. Volvo had uh, instituted teams that worked together on the car as it moved through the assembly line uh, so it can be finished. This was of particular interest to Ford because, as we all know, Ford was um, particularly responsible in automotive circles for instituting the assembly line. Right. Okay. Mm -hmm. So Ford went to Sweden to inspect and see what Volvo was doing. When they showed up, however, Ford brought several cars for their people to drive, for their, their Ford executives to drive. Um, but the cars that they brought at the time was the Lincoln Mark IV. Ah. Okay. And if you think about um, the 70s, late 70s Lincoln Mark IV, it had this type of roof design to it. It definitely did. It had an opera window in the mm -hmm. back usually, mm -hmm. yeah. And the wide C-pillar. Mm -hmm. And so this was of particular interest to the people who worked in and uh, towards the top of Volvo. They knew that in order to institute this type of look on their car, they'd have to take this off of the regular assembly line because it would cost too much money to do this in-house. So they sent it to Bertoni. And that is the insignia there, correct? Correct. It's Bertone. Mm -hmm. Okay. Well, as we go around to the back, again, like you were mentioning, it's more Volvo 240 design styling. There's nothing really much going on below yeah. the belt line. No. Volvo Coupe. <laughs> and also on the side is equally as nice. There is some paint blemishes that are kind of like a, the clear coat's rubbing through, but really it's in pretty good shape for being a 1980. And it's got nice wheels you can see in the back windows it has volvo sound that's what it says volvo sound system mm -hmm. looks like maybe some six by nines or five by sixes or something i don't know what that is yeah your guess is as good as mine on that but it is in really a uh, really good condition like you were saying for a car that's you know as uh, as old as it is now it's nearly 40 44 years old probably not many of these left anymore no and i think 1980 was um uh, one of the more popular years uh, for uh, this vehicle. Um, I think this was one of the two years that they sold the most of these Bertones. Okay. Well, let's hop into the interior. I'm sure you've got some more information for us on that. Just a little bit. Okay. So as we're looking around, is any of this Bertone or? Um, probably the most remarkable thing about this interior is how unremarkably Volvo it is on the inside. Okay. Right? For, for all those changes that happened on the outside, the basic design of the dash, the, the coin trays, you know, all of that stuff is Volvo. Now you can tell that the gauge cluster in the center stack at the top, it looks like it was added on, you know, probably by the coach builder. Mm -hmm. But other than that, this is the same Volvo interior that I had seen for years. Now, um, you know, all that being said, what isn't normal is how much leather this car has in it. Mm -hmm. Right, all this tufted leather on uh, the door cards, uh, what you're sitting on, the back seats, they look like sofas. That was all, you know, to, to give that more upscale um, uh, appearance, you know, that, that you should have when you send your car to a, uh, to a custom coach builder. What about this wood paneling? Is that something that would have been Volvo or is that Bertone, you think? This would have been Bertone. Bertone, yeah. okay. Um, you know, in fact, when I was uh, when I was actively selling Volvos, what was interesting was, you know, if we had a car that came over um, uh, from, like, let's say, a military serviceman, how many of those cars were cloth interior? Mm -hmm. Most all of the cars over uh, in Europe are cloth interior. Leather is an American thing. It's okay. something that we like. Um, and so, you know, all of this shiny, you know, bright work and burled woods and, and tufted leathers and things like that. Volvo is a very understated company. Understated, you know. okay. It's very comfortable in here. Do you think some of the seating and things that was styled after 
some of the Ford products that they saw? Or I think that they were going for, for I mean, because if we think about, again, the, the leathers and the woods and things like that, that's definitely something you'd find in the Lincoln Mark. Right. You know, um, I do want to mention, though, that that back seat is particularly mounted lower to try to give you as much headroom as you could in what is uh, otherwise amounting to a chopped top. So it's rather unremarkable other than some of the leather additions and wood and things. It's pretty much Volvo in here. Yeah, I think, in fact, the uh, there's only two options for this car. And uh, that is which one of the stereos that they offered and a limited slip differential. Those are the two options. Everything else is standard on this. Wow. All right, well, let's go ahead and hop under the hood. Well, there's a PRV, which is a Peugeot Renault Volvo, mm. 2.7 V6. Mm -hmm. 127 uh, raging horses. Raging horses. Mm -hmm. I sent you a picture of this car, actually, you had a very interesting comment. Love the car, hate the engine. That's right. <laughs> I think most people that have any vehicle with this engine were not happy with its performance, working on it, it also the Bosch CIS injection system. It's not very fun to work wait, wait, on. Wait, what's wrong with the CIS? Most people don't work <laughs> on it anymore. I'm and sure. like if you let them sit for four, five, six, seven years, you don't drive the car, right. especially a full system replacement. Mm -hmm. From here all the way back to even the fuel tank, everything. It could be five, six, seven grand to do that. And people are like, well, I didn't pay that for the car. Yeah, yeah. You know? 20 years ago, uh, 20, heck, 30 years ago, because, you know, some of my cars that I had at the time had CIS from Volkswagen, you know, those uh, fuel metering heads were still ungodly expensive, you know, mm -hmm. five, six hundred dollars at that time. Yeah. You know, and I, I just can't even imagine trying to attempt anything with it right now. Every, and in today's money, everything on this is 700 for that, 300 for that, 500 for that, and it tallies up really, really fast. Mm -hmm. Then you got all the labor to do all this. Then you got to set it up with a gas analyzer, and it's, it's quite complicated. Well, the interesting story about, um, about this power plant in particular is that I never really saw this much in Volvos. Uh, when we would service them at the dealership is because people brought in their DeLoreans. Right. It definitely is a DeLorean engine, but you mentioned, you were telling me there's other makes and models that had this in it as well? Yeah, the, um, the Renault is Space, uh, the, uh, I believe the, the Alpine. Mm -hmm. um, but you know, some of these cars were just vehicles that we never saw right. you know, um, here stateside. This engine saw a lot of service in Europe. Mm -hmm. It was uh, pretty popular, it was supposed to be lightweight you know, um, and compact. Uh, and originally, this engine was uh, a modular design um, and was supposed to be a V8. And at the uh, last moment, they changed and committed to a six-cylinder for this. Oh, I didn't know that. That's interesting. Mm -hmm. Well, it's actually in here. It was running very, very rough. The Imagine that. The customer actually had replaced all the fuel system and everything somewhere else. I don't know where okay. or how that all went. And it had a tune-up and everything, which is the distributor sits underneath this entire assembly, it's hard to get to. But I checked fuel pressures, I checked injectors, I checked all kinds of things. And as you can imagine, you cannot hook a scan tool or a computer to this. It's all old school, old world diagnostic. A lot of the young techs anymore are like, nah, bro, I'm good. I don't even want to open the hood. Yeah, the sad story now is that the, the people who are, um, who are most adept at being able to work on this, this engine have um, largely you know, kind of passed on at this Yeah, point. a lot of them have passed on. A lot of the knowledge is gone. Mm -hmm. But I'll show you what I found, why it was running rough. It took some digging, but I found it. Okay. So one thing I found, it was misfiring, and I could add fuel with like starting fluid or a little bit of propane actually to this metering plate through mm -hmm. there, which should compensate for any injection problems and make it start running smoother, but right. it didn't. Mm. It still was blah, 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 blah. The engine was visibly shaking. And I would pull plug wires, and it would seem like it got worse or better, and it was hard to pinpoint. And I was just like, it's an ignition system failure. It's a misfire, but it's happening at random all the cylinders. And I was like, how can that happen? And it's like, it must be inside the cap. Mm. So what I found was, and here's the cap. I pulled it off. So here's a brand new rotor I've ordered for it. And you can see this one's burned, almost yeah. a, burned a hole through it. Absolutely. And inside the cap, there's a little black center portion. It's actually a graphite electrode. Mm -hmm. As you can see in this picture on my phone, there's a protruding graphite electrode that's spring-loaded. It's supposed to contact the rotor. If I push on this, 
that's as far down as it'll go. It's somewhat still spring loaded. There's just nothing left there's to nothing it. There's nothing there, yeah. <laughs> so what I imagine happened is whoever did the tune-up on this, however long ago it was, when they went to put the cap on, which like I mentioned is very hard to do, it's underneath the metering head, they, it probably broke the tip of it mm. off or cracked it enough to where eventually later on down the road it finally gave way and it was arcing from here to there. That was going to be my next question. And it was cutting. It was arcing across yeah. there. Yeah. And it cuts the power of the spark in half almost. Wow. It's barely enough to keep it running. So it was misfiring at random all over the place while this was spinning. And that definitely is the problem what's going on here. It's not fuel related. It's not base engine with compression. I did a compression test. Everything's good. So. Mm -hmm. And I can't imagine that that uh, distributor cap was cheap. Uh, I think it was almost a hundred bucks, eighty bucks yeah. or something. Mm -hmm. Good luck finding PRV distributor caps. Exactly. Yeah. So that'll get him back on the road. It should solve his violent shaking engine. It'll make it run smooth again. I've had several DeLoreans in the shop, and based on working on those, actually gave me the experience to work on this. So, like I mentioned, I know the engine. I'm familiar with the engine, but the rest of the car, I knew I probably should call Adrian in and. Get yeah, the story. This um, this engine, I believe, and I know somebody in the comments is gonna, you know, angrily dispute this, but whatever. I believe that this engine saw service until about 1988 or 89, just in very, very limited numbers. And when uh, they had stopped production of the 262 Bertoni, they had gone into what's known as the 780 Bertoni, mm. which is more on that wedged seven series uh, platform. And by its last year, you could get both the 2.7 liter six, or you could get the turbo four, which of course, as you know, for me, is my favorite, you know, of right. the old Volvo engines was that turbo four cylinder. Mm -hmm. And they switched from a live axle to an independent rear suspension, had even more leather in it. And the design is, is, just, is just gorgeous. So Volvo over a period of roughly a decade, had a really friendly relationship with uh, with their Italian coach builder friend. Very good. Well, thinking of engines, I've been seeing you eyeballing the 348 engine over there yeah. here quite a bit. Yeah. You want to go take a peek at that? I, I do want to see that engine. All right. Let's go do that. All right. Well, it looks like we're in this together. Yeah, I think so. This is actually Euroasian Bob's 348. And I don't know. I've even stood inside of a 348 engine bay. No. And no reason to. No. Um, I don't even know why we did now. I don't know either. Okay. Let's go take a look at the engine. Let's go look at the engine. All right. All right. So this is the back half, the working half of the whole car. I like it. I mean, it just looks like you can't do anything on this without taking everything out. Yeah, it's designed to come out as a unit package. But uh, your Asian Bob has this. This is his vehicle, and he bought it knowing that services need to be caught up on it. And I don't know how many years it's been, but it's been a long time. The, uh, the timing belts, I don't know how old they are, but you can see, like, this is pretty tight here. This one's floppy loose. And I don't know if they're three years old, 10 years old, 15, I have no idea, but we're going to be replacing it all anyways. And this is before they went to timing chains, correct? The, this uh, is the, like the last platform. No, the 355 has these, and also the 360 has timing belts. Okay. But then after you get past that, you start getting into timing chains. Okay, so like the 430s and then beyond they went. Yeah, 458, all those gotcha. cha uh, chains. But this one's getting a full work over. It's going to be thousands of dollars. Actually, we just did a video. It's called Thousands and Thousands of Dollars. It's, yeah. it's going to be a lot. I'm just a big fan of these cars. And, you know, anytime, it, really, I'm just kind of a big fan of, of engines. I always want to know how things come out, how they work. Mm -hmm. And... You know, growing up as a as a kid, you you know you always figured you weren't going to get within ten feet of a of a Ferrari, let alone being able to kind of see its inner working. So the, this is always fascinating to me. So sorry to to push for the diversion to take a look at this. Oh, it's, it's no problem. One interesting thing about this and a 355 is that a clutch is not an engine out or transmission out job. Really, it's right here in this basket. You Wait take a these bolts off. Okay. Pull this off, and uh -huh. there's the uh, pressure plate and clutch and everything there with a the shaft that goes through to the flywheel. Wow. Wow. Isn't it interesting how things that should be an expensive fix on an exotic car aren't, and then the things that shouldn't be expensive 
or ungodly expensive. Ungodly expensive, expensive yeah. So a clutch job on this, all of the parts would be expensive. It's mm -hmm. not a major tear down or pull all kinds of stuff out. You just pull the back bumper off and it's right there. Wow. Pretty, but pretty in cool. Order to do the timing belt, you gotta pull the whole engine and transmission out. Yes. That's crazy. This and the 355 has to have it done this way to 360 actually has where you can pull the seats out and there's an access panel in the, I guess you call it the firewall or behind you. It's about this big. Mm -hmm. And you can reach in there and do the timing belt service. Yeah, I think MR2s are that way and yeah. been that way for years. And, and why, the reason why is like this has a fuel tank right behind you. Okay. So you can't physically get to the timing belts because it's a big tank. But on the 360s, it has a left and right tank, which is the gap in the middle is open. Now you can reach the front of the motor. Oh, okay. Danielson's having fun with this, and he's getting his list together, and it's like five pages long already. Good. Oh, and the catalytic converters are <laughs> shot. <laughs> I'd say. Do they, uh, are there, is there anybody making uh, this I, I th more? Are you having to go to an aftermarket? We're going to check and see. I don't know if they still have these in stock or if someone makes some or if we'll have to put some aftermarkets on. We're kind of exploring those options now. Yeah. I don't know if anyone can figure it out. It'll be you. Yep, we'll get it figured out. So that's what's wrong with this 262 Bertone was ignition system, cap, and rotor. And thanks to Adrian for coming along and giving oh, us. Thank you. The rest of the story, as Paul mm -hmm. Harvey would say. <laughs> it's, a, it's quite an interesting history. You know, um, you don't equate the, I guess, kind of stodgy, you know, Swedish manufacturer with, you know, uh, at the time, a, a higher end um, Italian design house. Mm -hmm. But like I said, for about a decade, uh, they had a, a really cozy relationship. Very cool. Mm -hmm. Well, if you're curious what kind of tools we use to work on this or any other car we have in the shop, check our Amazon affiliates link in the description below. We get a small cut and we really appreciate it. And make sure to hit the subscribe button because there's, as you can see, many more cool videos to come. And hopefully soon we'll have you back on for yeah. maybe a Volkswagen or something that will come I look in. forward to it. We just had a Phaeton in here, W12 Phaeton. And you didn't call me. I didn't call oh you. I should have called you. You should have called me. Isn't that like a, I should have called him? <laughs> okay, anyways. Anyways, thanks for watching.